Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for UBC's COP27 Live with COP27 delegates moderated by Lisa Johnson. My name is Nikki Afshapur. I'm the Regional and International Engagement Assistant at the Sustainability Hub. I've been involved with planning UBC's COP27 delegation and I'm very happy and honored to be here with you all today. I'm joining you all from the traditional, ancestral, and stolen land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The climate crisis has shown us how connected we all are, how consequences can carry across time and space. Climate change has also amplified pre-existing inequalities by bringing greater harm to those who are vulnerable. For example, Indigenous peoples all over the world tend to face the consequences of climate change early on and more strongly. Despite their lack of culpability in creating imbalances in our ecosystems. So, as we have discussions about our climate in today's session, in COP, and beyond, I invite you to reflect on the land you're in, its people, its original caretakers, and how we can decolonize the systems we live in. So today I'll be giving a quick introduction to the session and then I will pass it over to Lisa Johnson who will lead a moderated discussion with COP27 delegates and then facilitate the audience Q&A. Some housekeeping for today is that the chat function will be disabled. So we ask you to please post questions in the questions box during discussions. And also, if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to put those in the questions box as well. And also, if you're from the media and haven't yet been in touch with Lou or Alex from Media Relations about joining our post-event media session, feel free to put your email in the questions box as well, and then that way we can send you the details. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Lisa Johnson. Lisa is a senior writer and editor at CBC News. She helped create CBC Radio's What on Earth, which won the 2021 CGF Award for Climate Solutions Reporting. She's reported for CBC on TV, radio, and online for over 15 years with a specialty in science, nature, and the environment. Thank you, Lisa, for being here with us today. And now I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. We have Gideon. Oh, let's start with Vanessa. We have Vanessa. She's a professor of educational studies in the Faculty of Education. And she's also the interim director of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. We have Gideon, a master's engineering student in the electrical and computer engineering department. We have Rudri a PhD student in the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. We have Simon, a professor at the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability, as well as in the Department of Geography, as well as the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries. He's also a member of the Net Zero Advisory Body. We have Basher. He's studying in the Bachelor of International Economics in the Faculty of Arts. And we have Shannon, Shannon is the Clinical Assistant Professor in the School of Population and Public Health. Thank you so much to our delegates for being here. This was a very, very brief overview of them. So if you'd like to read more about them, please check out their full bios that's on the event page for today's session. We hope you enjoy today's discussion. And Lisa, I will now pass it on over to you. Okay, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I am I'm Lisa Johnson. I work for CBC for the network news and I'm lucky enough to be part of our uh, of people covering climate. I live in the mountains of BC on Sinaix traditional territory. So I'm, I'm joining you today from there. And I'm so excited to learn from all the delegates. Good evening to you in Egypt and those of you who are back in Vancouver or somewhere in North America, good afternoon. So I'm going to be starting uh, with a, and, and all the, the, um, all the delegates, all the panelists, feel free to turn your video on now so people can see your faces. Um, I'm gonna start with a question, one question to everyone. So those in the audience can sort of see you, hear from you a little bit. And then we're gonna be going into more of a free form discussion. 
Now the technology is a bit magic that lets us join from all parts of the world today, but sometimes it might be working against us. So if we accidentally you know, trip on each other's words, we're just going to assume that is gremlins in slow internet and not anyone trying to interrupt one another. Um, and if we freeze, then, uh, then we'll, we'll move on and come back to you. Okay, so I'm going to put Simon on the spot for the first question um, in terms of this COP and the actual negotiations. Can you set the stage for us a little bit in terms of what are some of the top points that the negotiators have been trying to hammer out? Uh, sure, thanks, Lisa. And it's nice to see everybody. Uh, well, those of you that I can see. Um, this this COP is, uh, it's you know, I think the, the subtitle they have for it is an implementation COP. Not every conference of the parties is negotiating is many of the big picture items. And that that is simply because um, schedules are set far in advance. So last year in Glasgow was a deadline to settle a whole bunch of things. This year, a lot of what they're doing is filling in the details on previous activities. So uh, the carbon market mechanism that's approved under Paris, they've more or less approved the rules, but they haven't worked out the details of how it's gonna happen. So that's on the agenda. Um, coming up with a new uh, system and goal for climate finance for the developing world is on the agenda. And then the really big thing that's dominating a lot of the conversations, I think in the hallways as well, is this idea of loss and damage. And if you haven't uh, heard of that before, and you're not sure what it is. It's the idea that um, of providing basically funding and support to places that have already been affected by climate change, right? And so it's sometimes talked about as liability or compensation. Uh, it's been uh, quite controversial because people, dis, uh, depending where you are in the world, there's been disagreement on whether funding should be provided, uh, particularly the U.S. was quite against providing actual funding. And that's been on the agenda this week. It's unclear what will come of it, um, but that's definitely uh, a big thing that was, was pushed onto the agenda um, earlier this week. And I'm happy to, I'll talk, I can talk a little bit more later about uh, how Egypt's managing all of this, the Egyptian presidency. Okay, yes. Thank you. I know that was putting you in the hot seat, hot seat to try and sum up, you know, 200 countries in a week so far and so on. But I, I know you can do it because we ask you that all the time on the air. And some of those themes of fairness and who pays and who's responsible, obviously, are going to keep coming up here. Um, Vanessa, I'd love to go to you next. You're working with an Indigenous delegation uh, from the Amazon in Brazil, if I'm understanding right, to advance their agenda at COP. And what has that been like? What has your experience been like in terms of having those voices heard? It's very interesting. So in most spaces at the COP, you don't hear people critiquing the single story of progress, development, and civilization that uh, monetizes, financializes nature. And this group is trying to say that they are the voice of the forest, the voice of both the humans and non-human beings coming to say that the forest doesn't want to be monetized, that carbon trading is actually carbon colonialism. There are false solutions to the climate crisis that we're facing mass extinction in slow motion. And we're not paying attention that the same uh, system that created the problems cannot offer adequate solutions. So it's, it's interesting how uh, we are asked to speak, because I'm, I'm the translator also uh, for, for the delegation that's working with a wider network, actually of indigenous people who, who today had uh, an action at the COP for the missing and murdered women in Canada. And it was a, it's a, it was a big thing. That's why I'm wearing, I'm wearing red. And it was a very emotional day today. So um, yeah, so the, the, the bigger network is the Climate Justice Alliance of Indigenous People and the Indigenous uh, eco, uh, Environmental Network in the, in, in the United States that produced this uh, book about false solutions to the climate crisis, which is called Hoodwinked in the Hot House. And they talk about nature-based solutions and uh, carbon markets and other um, green solutions as uh, being embedded in complicit in colonialism. And they emphasize that the IPCC has also uh, indicated that colonialism is both the cause and the driver of the climate crisis. But it's very difficult, I think, in a place like COP, they, these people per perceive COP as a trade show that uh, wants to profit from the disaster. It's very difficult for people to, to hear uh, and for their message to land. So it's been both extremely interesting to work at the critical cracks, but also very heartbreaking. <laughs> 
Mm, it sounds like an emotional day for sure. Um, Shannon, I'd like to go to you next for sort of this opening question where if you're just joining us, we're hearing sort of a little bit of each, from each of the delegates and then we'll go to a broader discussion. Now, you're a public health physician and a Coast Salish woman. And I know you were interested in connecting with other uh, Indigenous people and how those voices were being heard at the COP. What's your sense of whether, of, of how that is going and whether they're being heard or not? Can you say the last part again? Of whether Indigenous voices are being heard, are being um, uh, sort of getting in, perhaps not to the actual negotiations, but at least to to the uh, the attention spans of those those at COP, because I know that's been a frustration at past conferences of parties. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll I'll reference as you said, like I'm a, a public health physician. So heading into COP, I had been part of the um, there's a global health collective, and within those conversations leading up to COP, there was a lot of push towards like what kind of policies this group was putting forward. And really I discovered early on that um, my interests as an indigenous public health physician were not really on the health agenda. So I've um, really looked to, uh, you know, be at discussions and interface with um, uh, Vanessa, uh, you know, and uh, Pasang who were there today, being at the indigenous people's pavilion, uh, being at, other places where there are some Indigenous conversations that are being highlighted. Um, some of the things I can say is that, uh, you know, there's, it, it's not, there, there is, there are conversations going that you can find, but it certainly is not a um, narrative that I feel is strong throughout the whole conference. And um, you mentioned negotiations at the end. Yeah, the Indigenous peoples are not involved in the negotiations. Um, so while, I mean, it's encouraging that there is, you know, consistent places and spaces that you can go to find these types of conversations, they're still largely, you know, kind of off to the side, not integrated, and it's largely looking at a technical, not a relational, or what is our relationship with our environment, um, with these places we call home, with the beings that support us and have supported us for generations upon generations. It's really not a relational type of conversation as a dominant narrative, it's more of a technical uh, conversation. Interesting, thanks for breaking that down for us. Those are things we'll come back to as well in this discussion. Um, Gideon, I want to go to you next. And I know that you've noted before how dominated COP discussions, um, and maybe even the climate change sphere more generally, have been by male voices and not a lot of room for youth and an exclusion of non-binary folks. And I'm wondering if you could tell me what you, you've seen at COP in terms of that. Oh, wow. This is supposed to be a small, this is supposed to be, <laughs> what, what, what's the- Yeah, like, could you just, could you just give me a soundbite thing? about that? Okay. Um, so I guess I'll start with the non-binary thing just because I, that's kind of a bit more easier. Um, so, oh gosh, that's that's very emotional. Um, I, I I've been speaking to a lot of like not just trans people, but also just people who are LGBTQ two S plus, um, and a lot of them have been told going to this convention to keep that under wraps and to not be who they are essentially going to this, and it's kind of this whole other things with other other groups of marginalized groups that um, who are excluded from these conversations of being at the table or just being in, excluded from the plans of um, how we're going to adapt to this crisis. And uh, it's so hard for me to explain, but it's, if we can't be who we are when at these negotiations, how can we actually um, have these actual rich, conversations about what diversity is missing and how can we actually critique what's going on at COP if we can like can I ask have you have you felt safe no um I it's been better but um I felt very in the in the week going up to COP I was very scared to my safety to the point of paralysis in terms of even questioning whether I should even go at that point um, and 
there are people who probably like question even that if that's true but it's what my reality is kind of like being a non-environmental person and having my existence kind of excluded in these conversations like when you talk about even at cop when you talk about gender you don't talk about you talk about women and girls you don't talk about other aspects of gender so if we can't even talk about the existence of non-binary people or gender diverse peoples how can we actually even include them in the conversations um i guess going back to the male dominated aspects um as I'm not been too f included in the whole international aspects of this, um, it is just another aspect of, and well, youth, I guess. It's, we are so dominant in terms of who is impacted as well as who will be impacted in terms of youth being the future generations, but also um, it is, it is just a matter of power. Like the, there's a lot of people saying that the climate crisis is a matter of power and um, or that there of power and who is versus who is impacted. And uh, yeah, it's it, I love to get. I'm so tired. Um, yeah, but that's that's I guess that's, <laughs> that's an okay to that. <laughs> that's that's an opening to some of the places this discussion may go. And thank you for being everyone being. Um, willing to let me bounce from topic to cop topic on these very big issues of fairness, colonialism, gender, it's, it's huge. But I am going to bounce again. Uh, Rudri, uh, I know what you're back in Vancouver now, you're in COP for the first week. And in terms of your research interests, like what did you see, if anything, about the energy transitions happening around the world? Any ideas that you found inspiring from what you saw there? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that question, Lisa. I am back in Vancouver and it is good to be back. Um, there was a lot of conversation around energy transition right from the opening World Leaders Summit to negotiations to a lot of pavilion events. And I think a lot of it centered around phasing out fossil fuels, especially coal and oil and gas. And I was really happy to, to more solar and wind power. And I was really happy to see a lot of focus on just energy transitions. It essentially meaning nobody should be left behind and it should not adversely affect some communities over others. So I was following a lot of the conversations around this just energy transitions. And I think two main points that came up um, most was first access or availability of data, data meaning good quality of data as well as data by by whom for whom. So data collected more from a bottom up method by those who are affected the most um, by either phasing out of fossil fuels or even adoption of clean um, technologies and uh, clean energy. Second was a lot around climate finance for the energy transition for um, adaptation efforts as well as investments in solar or wind power projects. Um, especially in the global south. So there were a lot of conversation about balancing investments from both the public sector, I mean, the governments, as well as attracting more private investments, because currently there's a huge dearth of private investments in um, clean technology. So how to attract private investments and gain their confidence to invest in huge clean energy projects in the global south. Um, so those are kind of um, sort of the main areas where I saw clean energy transition show up, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Mm -hmm. And Basher, last to you. Um, now you grew up in Bangladesh, and you um, your hometown you've written is is slated to be underwater. So this is not like only an academic concern for you. Um, coming from that perspective, how has that driven your desire to be at COP, and then what you're seeing there as all of these countries are coming together to negotiate that future. Thank you for that question, Lisa. Um, apologies for the background music. I'm still in Cairo. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> it was very interesting. Um, I'll be honest, I went to COP with a lot of expectations. I had no idea how it is going to be or what to feel. And everything was a surprise to me for that reason. Just seeing um, a lot of those pavilions and how a lot of those negotiations took place. It was quite interesting and new to me. Um, I did hear about my, like, you know, how some of these take place, but just witnessing that from a first-hand perspective, 
uh, was quite interesting. I spent a lot of my time um, at COP uh, speaking with the folks from Bangladesh Pavilion um, and just gazing their perspectives on a lot of these things and issues. And I'll be honest, I feel um, there's definitely a gap in terms of uh, what the world is doing and how, like, and what people who are disfranchised, who are being more affected, needs. And it's not true only for Bangladesh, but many of the other countries that are um, that are that are being very uh, severely affected due to climate change. And just being able to connect with um, people from other countries, especially young people, um, it was quite interesting. I spent a few of uh, like half of the day speaking with a youth group from Baluchistan and just hearing their perspective. It was the first time they were traveling abroad and the passion they had um, in, in attending and in being in person at that place, I think um, that was very visible. And I'll be honest, at some point I did feel like it was a trade show and how a lot of these, it's just a show for, you know, um, countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar to like, you know, promote a lot of the other things that they're doing. But I feel like this is also a place where people um, from a rural village in Balochistan can be and voice their concern. So I, it was a humbling experience. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing more uh, over the discussion. All right, thank you. I wanna pick up on that trade show theme because it's something that's already come up in the audience questions. And Tim, I'm wondering if you have that first news slide available to show, just to, um, I'm kind of bringing it up in a different spot than we thought about, but uh, a lot of the news coverage and then um, Elizabeth S had asked, what, what are your thoughts on so many more oil and gas reps attending this COP. This is a piece from the Financial Times and lots of media have covered it. Fossil fuel producers flex their muscle at UN Climate Summit. If you can see one of the quotes here that's coming up, um, sorry, my, it's, it's actually blocked a little bit on my screen, but talking about the goal to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius achievable ideally, but we don't see this as a discussion about fossil fuels. I'm wondering if any of the panelists would like to uh, to jump in on this topic that the audience is asking about and has been a lot in the news about the presence of uh, of, of oil and gas reps. Uh, Gideon, I see your hand up. Fun. Where do I start with this? So I actually want to like first um, jump in kind of on Rudy's comment about the just transition. Um, I guess part of it is related to this is that when we talk about when I've seen conversations about the just transition from more like high level representations, including from the environmental minister of Canada, I forget his name off the top of my head, but him, um, is that there's a large focus on the development of like green jobs or like green infrastructure, but there's not a lot of talk around the uh, decommissioning or like contraction of the oil and gas sector. And there's even, I, I find there's a lot of, um, removal of the just aspect but that's a whole other thing um there one um thing that i've kind of like really appreciated was the comparison to for instance the to tobacco industry within the world health organization and on how that was removed eventually due to um conflict of interest and that's how one way of removing uh, oil and gas representatives or voices from um at least at least like the vast majority because there's been i don't i don't have the actual statistics but they're probably like one of the largest delegations at cop and the and to address one aspect um that's like maybe like a good um critique against this opinion is that okay well the oil and gas community is needs to be part of the discussion because they're going to be very impacted by this. And I think this is true, but I think this is true of the workers. I think we need to care a lot about the workers, especially those who are who already face so many barriers within their own professions, let alone to be able to transition to a whole other profession, which is needed if we want to actually transition to the rate that we wish to actually meet the 1.5 degrees target um, is to include um, the workers, but not the corporations within these discussions at COP. And I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I imagine it is the, the corporations and not the workers there, though. Simon, you've been to COP before, right? Do you have any thoughts on this? 
I have I have been before a few a few years ago, um, the year after Paris. Um, you know, I, I I'll say that there's there it's it's important to distinguish between the different types of of, of badges, like how you access COP, right? So there's okay. um, right. So there's um, to to attend the conference of the parties. There's the official country delegates. And they have like a pink line on their badge, which means you're a part of the party and you can sit in all of the negotiations and you're often at the table doing the negotiating. And then there's sort of um, other members of the government parties that are doing support or the government's uh, invited them to come along. There's Canada, for example, invites a lot of people from civil society to be a part of the delegation. They're not allowed to stay in closed door meetings, but they're there. And then there's universities, research organizations, all sorts of other things like us that have observer status. So the oil and gas companies, it's interesting because there are a lot of, um, I mean, I, it's disturbing, but at the same time, I do worry sometimes that the press coverage makes it sounds like they're sitting in there at the negotiations with the countries at the table, but they can't do that. They're not allowed yeah. in. That's only diplomatic UN stuff. That doesn't mean they're not talking to people outside, but even if they are, um, that's not going to have an influence now. Like it's the fact that they're lobbying for years before these conferences that is almost more worrisome to me than their presence here. And it's not to minimize their presence here, um, but just to say on the actual negotiations, the damage they're doing is being done in advance of meetings, right? And so what they're doing here is they're trying to influence their, you know, they're trying to be present and influence the conversation uh, at all the side events and pavilion events that were being mentioned, which are sort of like the separate conference that surrounds the diplomatic negotiations, right? And so that's not by no means a defense of having that many oil and gas reps here. Um, but UBC um, professor yeah, defends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we move on to the next question? So I'm going to, I want to go to like a very, very big picture question, but pulling a thread from a bunch of the uh, the introductory questions, which is um, thoughts on sort of the role. Okay, this is a PhD thesis, or it's a question in a in a panel. Uh, if, take your pick. But sort of the role of colonialism. Several of you brought it up. It may not feel obvious to everyone in the audience the way that colonialism connects with the climate crisis we're in today. And I'm wondering if anyone would take a leap and, and try to connect some of those dots to help people understand the sort of really big picture problem that several of you alluded to. Shannon? Okay, I can give it a go. All right, Shannon. All right. <laughs> I would love to hear from you both, but please, uh, someone go ahead. Uh, sure, I can start. Um, so yeah, I will share that I'm a uh, um, Halkamitnam from Stamanis First Nation on Vancouver Island and a lot of family ties to Couch and Tribes as well, which is our largest First Nations community in BC. And I am the medical health officer for my home territory. And um, I am the first Halkamitnam person that's been in this colonial type role, being a medical health officer in my own home territory. And while colonially that position is really only looking after the health of humans and all the legislation, the colonial legislation, the Public Health Act, which has just been enacted a lot during the COVID pandemic, the Drinking Water Protection Act, all those pieces of legislation are from a colonial lens, which means that they're really only looking at health from a human aspect. I'm only really enabled in my role to protect human health and um, factors in our environment are only actually viewed as risks to our health. So the Drinking Water Protection Act, for instance, is looking at water as something we use and that I'm supposed to help protect us from how water can sometimes harm us if it's contaminated or what have you. Um, and that very much takes away from my view of the world as water being a relative, something I'm in an intimate relationship along with the land, the animals, the plants, and that that relationship is actually the foundation of my health. It's the foundation of the health system. And working within the system, I have a lot I have to reconcile intentions that sometimes bring me, you know, to tears sometimes in my job because I'm not, I'm not because of what has happened since contact within my own home territory is the um, disruption, the targeting and the denial 
of that relationship with our home territories. And when you're not in an intimate relationship with the land, the water, the animals, the plants, you look at it very differently. You look at it as, as something you use. You look at it as something you don't need consent with to, um, you know, uh, take into your body or um, utilize for building your home or a place you live or something like that. So that set up basically a cascade of events of separating us, of disrupting the relationship with what's around us. And that disruption of the relationship has caused us to be in balance and is now where we find ourselves where, um, you know, in fact, you know, as uh, someone who um, Vanessa and I were spending time with today, um, Chief Ninawa from the Amazon, he's like, we're not, we are nature. So this, this, this disruption is um, affecting all of our health. And basically, unless we get to the root cause of that, unless we start to heal that relationship, to repair that relationship, to nurture the environment around us, so it can also nurture us back, anything else that we're doing is just a band-aid approach and not getting to that fundamental principle of how we're actually connected and what is going on with our environment is ultimately what is going on with us. And as Indigenous peoples, because, and I, I appreciate that the language was not used earlier in the conversation, it was, um, I can't remember what the language was, but it wasn't like, oh, Indigenous peoples are more vulnerable to climate change, because then there comes something about us and what we are and what we, you know, who we are as Indigenous peoples that is actually the problem because we're vulnerable. No, we're nature. Nature is actually vulnerable to the way we've been doing things for the past, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And the ultimate cause of that is an extractive, exploitive, um, occupying and dominating approach to the places we belong to. Thank you. Vanessa, I'm seeing you nodding along. And I also wanted to sort of add to that question, something from the audience it's great, questions. It's Shannon, thank you. <laughs> So from, um, um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say just to compliment that uh, it's the imp colonialism is defined by Chief Ninoa as the imposed sense of separation between us and the land, us and each other and us from our own selves as seeing our metabolism as part of the wider metabolism of the land, you tend you will understand that the disease of the land is our own disease. So this sense of uh, separation that is imposed through the single story of progress, development, and civilization is what creates the situation where th there's hierarchies between people and there's the occupation of lands because then land is treated as, pro uh, as property. So what uh, Ninawa has been, Chief Ninawa has been saying is that while um, Western society is really ad has advanced uh, science and technology uh, geared towards um, domination <laughs> and uh, economic rationalization, indigenous people have advanced technology in terms of relationship building, in terms of uh, relationships grounded on trust, consent, reciprocity, and accountability, and reverence and respect towards the land. So the these two technologies may be like in one of the panels today in the U.S. pavilion where Chief Nino was speaking. Uh, they were talking about the integration of knowledges, right? Integration of scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge. And I know that it's, this is also one of the questions of, of, uh, that we received as panelists. And what Chief Nguyen uh said as a response is that there is an arrogance in Western society, in science and technology that's driven by Western society that prevents it from hearing. And until we de-arrogantize uh, these spaces, what happens then is that indigenous knowledge is, is perceived to be a complement to, to science or is perceived to need science to legitimize itself. So what they were talking about is that indigenous knowledge is, is science on its own, but it's a different kind of science. It's a science grounded in uh, respe respect, uh, reciprocity and responsibility, which is lacking uh, so it's uh, it, it, what what was being said is that uh, Western culture is lacking in respect, reciprocity, responsibility, and that is creating a, a situation where, uh, as we're trying to address the climate crisis, we are trying to profit from it and to financialize, commercialize, commodify nature, which is precisely what created the problem in the first place. 
but it's very difficult for people who are invested in these solutions, which seem to be quick fixes to a much wider poly crisis <laughs> that we're facing that leads to then our uh, mass extinction in slow motion scenario that uh, people still have hope in the continuity of the present. And, and for some indigenous people, that means the, fu the settler futurity and the continuity of the same system that created the problem in the first place. Thank you. I love that way of, of describing it as advanced technology and what was it responsibility and reciprocity. Such an interesting way of framing it. Um, Basha, there's a question for you uh, from the audience. Um, uh, Jessica, thanks you for sharing your experiences and wanted to know more about the gap you identified between the solutions that are discussed and are being discussed and what you mentioned people need to adapt to sort of what's, what's getting talked about and what's really needed. No, absolutely. So uh, my first few days at COP, I attended mostly the side events, um, which is to for the audience um, who haven't uh, had the chance yet. Um, so in COP, there are a lot of pavilions, uh, and these pavilions are uh, sometimes hosted by countries, sometimes by other organizations like UNDP or European Union or like GCF, and they host a bunch of side events to have panel discussions on different topics. So when, when I first entered, I uh, there's a list of pavilions on the UNFCC website um, and they had many side events, interesting side events. So my first few days I attended those side events to understand what these um, delegates from all around the world are actually uh, talking about and what they are concerned about. So it was interesting to see a difference in a lot of these discussions. For example, um, on during finance day, I um, like most of the events were talking about how we can get to net zero. How can we finance that? And like, what are some of like what are some of the roles that developing that developed uh, countries will play? Uh, however, on on like when it comes to different side events um, in other pavilions, like uh, the children and youth pavilion. I think we were speaking more about, you know, how we need to take immediate action, um, how things are, you know, like in. Uh, but but on the on the GCF uh, panels, they were speaking that whether it's feasible or not, or how how long will mm. that process look like. Um, so there was a gap between uh, those pavilions, and even when it comes to negotiations, I feel like the presence of youth um, youth observers was very limited. And I, 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 find, I found that personally uh, to be a problem because people um, were, were not so like on, on the go. They, they were a little hesitant in some way. However, I think climate crisis is something that needs immediate action. So I, 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 I identified those gaps and I felt that even my presence at some of those negotiations or um, like in some of those events where people were speaking more about uh, like feasibility of financing, uh, since there was less uh, less uh, saturation of young people, uh, it it was little more, you know, um, it it wasn't very radical. That's how I would put it. Yeah, hmm. that seems uh, like a, a huge issue, uh, right? In climate action, and so the difference between this is the the number one thing that needs to be dealt with in the way that if we can think back you know, before protests, et cetera, to the beginning of the pandemic, when it was all hands on deck, everything's changing overnight, to, well, let's be reasonable. Let's, what's feasible? What's too fast? What's too radical? Um, and there's such a, you know, the, the window, in my view, as a journalist who watches these things, the window is shifted in terms of what's feasible, but it's still very different than what the people who are watching it in my view, the people who are watching it most carefully would say where the world needs to be. Simon, I saw you nodding along for part of this. You wanna jump in? Oh, I, I just think it was a very good description of the, the challenge. I mean, this is, you know, the, the negotiations are sort of their own crazy diplomatic thing. And I think part of the way, I'm thinking a little bit of what Vanessa and Shannon were saying as well. I mean, part of the way that, Indigenous people, traditional knowledge, and everything gets shut out. Um, is that there's a whole culture to how diplomacy is done? There's a whole language. There's a whole 
legal thing that is extremely Western. And what I always find fascinating is, you know, they've got interpreters for the for six different languages at these events. I've been in many negotiations. I've heard I've never heard anyone not speak English. So all of the negotiators from all countries around the world are all speaking English, which it's you know obviously it's showing the the bias of of, of the system. And I think the way that whether it's youth activists or or um, anyone who's not a part of the process gets shut out, it's not just that you're not allowed to be at the negotiating table, but that it's this incredibly complicated legalese, this techno technocracy uh, uh, that is just hard to follow from the outside. And so the whole thing, the negotiations are very opaque, right? You kind of, it's sort of like you're either in the club or you're not. And I think that is extremely exclusionary. Does anyone else want to weigh in this uh, this discussion of, of well how the negotiations go and also the the maybe urgency gap between youth and older people, global south, global north? Go ahead, Ruji. Uh, hi, thanks, Lisa. So I was uh, following a negotiation on the national adaptation plans, um, and I think one big difference or I observed was in the first so each topic has a certain number of sessions assigned to them. And this particular one had, I think, six, five or six sessions assigned. So the first two sessions, almost no progress was made or very little was done. I think a lot of time was first given to finalizing the agenda. And then from the third session onwards, there was a lot more discussion happening. And I noticed, so Ghana was speaking on behalf of G77 and China and Argentina them putting more pressure on getting the discussions moving forward. Whereas on the other hand, countries like EU, US were asking for some more time to reflect on some of the text that they were discussing. So these discussions were about a document that um, would think be used by countries afterwards. And so I saw this difference in the sense of urgency um, between I think the global south and the global north on just the actions and as well as the language that was used in the document. For example, G77 countries wanted more clear language about climate finance and pathways of implementing that. Um, and so, yeah, I was just, it was really fascinating to observe this difference in the negotiations as well. I'd like to go now to one of the other news uh, articles that's come up. Tim, would you mind putting up the next one? It should be about India and uh, fossil fuels, I think. So this is a, another one of the news articles that um, uh, I'd love to get some panelists thoughts on. Um, India wants to phase down, wants phase down on all fossil fuels at COP27. Um, so this is, uh, if I'm understanding it right, some of what the countries are negotiating for, like the cover statement coming out of out of this week, and India pushing for um, a focus not just on coal but on all fossil fuels, um, and is likely to raise strong concerns from oil and gas reliant countries. This is a Bloomberg story. Anyone have any thoughts on on this? Is one of the one of the focuses, one of the things that's been making the news um, out of the COP negotiations so far. No? I mean, one of the things, oh, go ahead, Gideon. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of contemplating how to like start this or where we wanted to go with this. Um, but I guess suppose something we haven't talked about is that a large narrative that's been happening at COP27 is kind of using um, gas as a transitionary fuel, especially for like Africa and the global south. And the main, um, and a lot of this stems from or like the reason why this is allowed to happen is this lack of climate finance, for instance, the loss and damages that have, like loss and damages is not a new conversation. Loss and damages was established in like 2008 COP. And like the, the frustration has come from by 2020, which is what was in, eh, established in 2008 was we were supposed to arrange to a hundred billion dollars. We never got there. And that's why we're talking about this again. And uh, there's a lot of frustration in terms of 
the global south not receiving the finance that they receive that they should have received and that they deserve to receive and because of this there's also like this hypocrisy in any discussion for the global north to tell what the global south should do and therefore it's really hard to like say like no you shouldn't be investing in global south as your transitionary fuel or to get finance from fossil fuels and i think that's a large area where that stems from um I'm not sure how else I want to continue this, so I think I'll pause for now and then okay. conceptualize it while okay. others have their thoughts about this. Yeah. Uh, I guess one of the things that comes to mind for me, if any others want to, oh, Simon's there, but I'll just finish my thought, is um, it's not just, some of this is about sort of India as a country with a lot of reliance on coal, wanting coal not to be singled out, but then I guess part of what jumped out to me was just the interest in at the center of this conversation is, are we gonna be using more fossil fuels or not? And um, and that often seems to be left out of things, which is why I was curious in your thoughts, but maybe Simon wants to take it in another direction. Go ahead, wherever, whatever you wanna say about it. You're Sorry, you're muted, muted Simon. Yeah. I thought it unmuted, sorry. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to jump in again, but just if it's helpful for context, what India is doing this because of what came out in Glasgow last year, which was the, Gla the statement from Glasgow was the first time ever that any statement out of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change event had a reference to fossil fuels in it. And that sounds crazy, but countries, Saudi Arabia, others would always block any mention of fossil fuels. So last year, they managed in the cover statement, which is not the countries have to agree on that, but it's not like part of the negotiations in the same way that it affects decision making. It's more just a like a laudatory goal to phase down fossil fuels, uh, coal. It originally said phase out and they negotiated to phase down. And so India is just upset that it's focusing on coal where India's basically negotiators are saying, listen, we rely a lot on coal. We're a developing nation with low per capita emissions. And all these other nations are relying on oil and gas. Why doesn't it say all fossil fuels? So like, if you're gonna to have to say a fossil fuel, you have to say all of them is their argument. So it's not completely crazy, but I, I can't claim to know whether, what impact this will have on the negotiations. I haven't heard anything from anyone. Mm. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> I wanna come back to uh, people's personal experiences during this last week and a bit uh, that you've been there. Um, we've heard uh, from past COP delegates that it can be like super exhausting, which I believe, and also a really emotional experience, even though you guys are all there as you know, smart academics from a top university. Can you, can you go to the human level with me and talk about um, if, you've had, if, if it has been an emotional experience for you, if anyone wants to reflect on that? Go ahead, Basher. Yeah, I just want to say like, it was very, very overwhelming. Um, and I think every day I would feel a constant fear of missing out because there are just so many things happening around and so many interesting panel discussions and negotiations that I want to attend and witness. Uh, but it's just humanly not possible to, you know, even grasp one part of COP. And I honestly didn't expect that. And uh, my friend Rain, who was supposed to be here, um, was having a conversation with Professor Simon, and and he was he was he was he was being very nice about you know how this is virtually impossible. And I think until then I felt very overwhelmed. Uh, that being said, um, even just attending the panels that I attended and the negotiations that I could um, attend, uh, it felt very you know real because this is not something, this is not a model United Nations. It's everything that they're speaking about is actually being implemented. So in, in that sense, it felt very real and authentic. And it's crazy to see how a lot of the things that we study and talk about are actually very visible. Oil companies and uh, countries, uh, like countries being more powerful than the others. In some of the negotiation rooms, it was interesting to see how there was pin drop silence right when the US delegates were speaking. Um, and there, it was also very interesting to see how delegates from Pakistan were speaking for so long because they just went through a massive 
climate devastation um, and they were uh, wanting to receive like you know me, wanting what they wanted to see immediate action towards the climate fund uh, being distributed to uh, different agencies so it was it was quite interesting and I think I still am going through that adrenaline rush and like you know everything that happened last week for me and um, it's it's just overwhelming and just having those conversations with people I met from around the world I think a lot of the feelings were mutual. Hmm. Rodri, how about you? You're back. You've had a couple of seconds, maybe, to um, think about things, being back in Vancouver. Yeah, so I, I would like to first echo what Bash Bashar said. Uh, it can be really overwhelming. For me, just seeing the magnitude of events was super humbling in the sense of like the space where you have everything from official negotiations happening to side events, which include like press conferences, as well as pavilion events, and um, just the diversity of things and voices from all over the world. So very humbling, as well as very inspiring and powerful at the same time. Um, I think just being back, I, I was reflecting on cer certain well-being aspects of participants and observers there. I think two things of one, food was a big struggle. Um, just access to food and the cost of food there. Um, I was in Cairo before uh, going to Sharm el Sheikh, and then being in Sharm el Sheikh, like the stark difference between what the prices were targeted, who was the audience, all the prices were in US dollars in Egypt, as opposed to the local currency, and just the availability of food. I've spoken to so many people, especially students who had ice cream for lunch. And I personally just like would have energy bars and things like that. Um, some pavilions had coffee, which was great, including Canada Pavilion. And I think the second one was just transportation, getting to the venue from the hotel and back um, was, was a little chaotic. Uh, there was free transportation and transportation was available at all times. Uh, just those two things, I think, um, added to a bit of give layers to the conference, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we've got logistical gong show at times, high prices, um, a sense of overwhelm and fear of missing out. Anyone else on on sort of the maybe it was maybe it was the scene, maybe it was the content, but in a their sort of human level, what they're texting their friends back home kind of experience of COP. Uh, I guess I can continue. I'm not quite. Can you reiterate what you mean by that part, or I otherwise I can go on my own tangent of stuff. You can you can take it where you wish, but we've heard. Oh, but. Um, but yeah, Catherine Harrison had mentioned the, uh, before that that it she found it an emotional experience to be a cop, and I just wanted to open the floor uh, to see if anyone wanted to to reflect on that from their own perspectives. Okay. Um, I'm going to say first that like the experience of actually being a cop, like excluding everything else was like a wonderful experience to connect with a lot of like-minded individuals, especially within the youth and children pavilion and a lot of people who were advocating for uh, uh, of gender issues, at least for me. Um, but to go further on Rudri's thing, um, with regards to food, for instance, um, my goal, my essential thing, especially as someone who's vegan and where at the event, there's very little options for vegans. A main thing that were offered as food were like these quick things like muffins, pastries, things that I can't eat as a vegan. And of course, it's a very privileged thing for me to be vegan, um, but it is like a thing that happens. So essentially, I would just like fill myself on the breakfast buffet at my hotel and that would be my only meal for the day until I maybe get a meal in the evening. Um, and I've talked to Kate about this, who's been so helpful in terms of arranging this, but um, the emotional things around financial barriers. Um, when I arrived in COP, I was traveling with my mother and um, my partner, and I was going to share a room with my partner. And I booked through the COP27 website. And when I arrived at the hotel, they were like, oh, you're rooming with someone else. Well, you didn't include a second person in your reservation. So we're going to need to charge you for that. And they charged me like an additional, I think it was 2,800 US dollars for them staying for the entire time. 
and 3400 3400 USD. My partner is also here. Um, and I wasn't able to pay that. And it was so lucky because my USD, my credit card does not have that limit. And I know a lot of people would not be able to afford that. And it was so um, I was so privileged and lucky that my mother was there to help me with that and to have um, people at UBC to help me try to get as much um, money back for that thing as possible. But I didn't get all of it back and it probably it come, uh, it probably equated to all the funding I received, which was about $1,400 from the $1,000 stipend as well as a $400 scholarship. So it's, it's, it's extremely, and this is not, I'm not the only one who, who this happened to. There's a bunch of horror stories about Wait. people's, yes, say. Well, let's, it sounds like a very, very frustrating situation. Yes. And, I'll, and you can see how there'd be barriers to access for, for people to get to um, that place. I understand it's also been, been difficult and, and some sort of checkpoints and hard to move around in Egypt compared to maybe some other countries where cough had been. Anyone else? I, I, I think we've heard the logistics are hard. Does anyone else want to offer anything up on, on that topic before we move on to the next one? Yeah, Basher. I'm sorry for speaking again, but I just wanted to add that one interesting thing I noticed is I think the total number of delegates from Quebec was 40. However, the total number of delegates from Bangladesh was 97. So you can see the contrast between how an entire nation has 97 delegates, but a province has 40 or more than 40 observers only. So I just wanted to mention that because the funding, because of purchasing power parity, it creates a huge dynamic between developing countries and developed countries and their participation in COP. Mm, thank you. That's Those numbers are, are eye-opening. Um, we have a question, a couple of questions on a bit of a theme from the audience around um, whether you guys think that COP is an effective format to have the interactions between scientists, politicians, activists, NGOs, and then sort of on top of that, do you, and this, this one was directed to Simon though, if others have thoughts on it, I'm, I'm open to that. Do you see any of those perspectives making their way one way or another into what happens uh, in, the, in the actual negotiations? Um, Who'd like to take that? Simon, it sounded like you were saying real influence is whatever happens before COP and that the, the, the rest of the zone is, is something that is maybe your interact, groups are interacting with one another, but not with um, exerting influence on the negotiations. I mean, I'll just say, yeah, I mean, you, one can go and speak to the negotiators. I mean, it's not easy to find one of them uh, because they are uh, busy. Um, I think uh, if those that have been in negotiating sessions might have noticed that a lot of times, uh, particularly in the first week, the negotiators are quite young uh, and maybe not what you'd expect. Uh, later on, you, the lead delegate is going to be older. And it honestly is partly because they want uh, a young, energetic person that's not going to be able to do this and sleep four hours a night um, while while pouring over these discussions with all the other people. Like that, I've had I've had parties tell me that um, that intentionally. That's why they have the young person doing it, um, not, not an old guy like me. Um, but yeah, anyways, the. You can talk to them. It's not, there's not a bunch of uh, opportunities. I've had a couple of nice conversations with delegates, some that I knew, some that I didn't know, just, you know, whatever, I asked them a question and, and we talked. But realistically, you know, these people are representing their governments. The governments have already made a decision about what they're comfortable with. And so you're kind of, the negotiators, you know, are working with some range of what is acceptable or what is already known to be acceptable by the government back home. So it's hard to have a huge influence on the negotiations, but that doesn't mean you can't have an influence on the other circus of stuff going on here, right? And the negotiations is probably, I would say, Billy, you know, of the, the core of the meeting, that's probably like a few thousand people that need to be here for that. And the other 30 is, is all of this. And that's a place to have a negotiation of what civil society is doing and everything, right? So, um, it's, uh, you know, might not affect the text of the agreement, but it could affect the action on climate change, which is perhaps more important. 
Shannon, it sounded like you had had some interesting interactions in that that outer zone with um, in the health spheres and and so on. Sure. Um, I think what I'd like to comment on in context of this discussion is um, I had some knowledge about how the IPCC reports around um, you know climate change were the intergovernmental panel on climate change reports were were pieced together um, before coming to this event, but it was really illuminated to me in the in um, some sessions that it was in today around how like there was a discussion around um, indigenous knowledge and science and what's going on between these meetings and what is officially in these IPCC documents that negotiators like have on their tables while these conversations are happening and and you know kind of what is accepted by governments as evidence to where where we know we're at in terms of climate change and that this is this is a colonial process it is the states it is the governments that decide before the negotiations what's going on and it's the states and the government to decide what is evidence that is taken into these ipcc reports and while there has been some um movement forward and I want to acknowledge Pasang Sherpa as well, who's been part of these processes where there have been contributing authors now to these IPCC reports that are Indigenous. So for the first time going into this COP, colonialism was listed in an IPCC document as a driver and an exacerbator of climate change. And um, due to that, there was the, the recognition there needed to be Indigenous authors describing how colonialism had attacked them in the place that they belong to. But now it's like th there are no lead authors within the IPC documents that are Indigenous. So we have non-Indigenous peoples who are speaking on the panels because it's lead authors who need to be on the panels. And it's like, well, what are the barriers to Indigenous peoples being in those lead author positions? Well, the colonial academic structures that basically um, value Western scientific knowledge over indigenous knowledge. So like, you know, and, and then basically there's this push to have now the, the, the availability of indigenous lead authors going into the next stages of reports. Well, it's not something that can just happen overnight because it's a whole system that is basically um, disadvantaged indigenous knowledges and indigenous scholars from being there in the first place. So like, well, th so there's, there's little steps that are being taken, but it's still very much from the paradigm or the gold standard that the states and Western science set the parameters of when and the stages of how evidence comes into things like the IPC documents, which are evidence at the negotiation tables. So we've heard about fossil fuels being mentioned for the first time in Glasgow and colonialism being mentioned for the first time in a report heading into, into this COP, is that right? It's interesting how, how these things move. Um, I would, I'd like to go to um, the last two slides of news stories, which is kind of bringing things, uh, bringing Canada into the picture a little bit. Tim, if you could bring those up, spend a moment on one and then the other, and then I'll get the panelists to speak. Um, I know not everyone has, so coming from a you know a Canadian institution, whether or not you consider yourself a uh, Canadian, but <clears throat> so one headline: Canada has made tremendous progress, says Gibbo, as emissions grow. And the this headline or lead from Canadian press is Canada's carbon dioxide emissions crept back up in 2021. They're falling sharply during the pandemic, and experts believe they will go up even further this year as the return to normal has accelerated. Then the next slide is getting more into the funding from countries. Richer nations, including Canada, inch closer to paying for climate change. But uh, Guibo, the environment minister and lead negotiator uh, for Canada there, says it can't be about liability. Developed nations cannot sign into something that would make the Canadian public and the European public and the American public liable for Lord knows how many hundreds of billions of dollars of damages. So to the panelists, um, what are your, do, who has thoughts on sort of the role of Canada um, and how, can, how the Canadian government is doing on both of those, those pieces, cutting emissions here, and then also dealing with the, um, like, I guess, historical and ongoing responsibility of 
funding, mitigation, adaptation, and then loss of damage. And has anyone had anything to say to you when they hear you're from a Canadian university? Oh, jump in. Go ahead, Simon. Everyone's going to stop nodding when they, uh, yeah, when they know that I'm going to I mean, I'm, I, want, I would love to have somebody else uh, chime in on this. Um, I'll say yes. two things. The first is absolutely uh, people comment on being from Canada. My badge looks different from everybody else's because of dual uh, role. I'm both there as a member of UBC, but also um, because I advise the federal government, I do have party delegation as well. Um, and as a result, it has been very interesting because I've been an observer in the past and I have really enjoyed being able to sit down and talk to people from many other parts of the world. I spend a lot of time with people from the Pacific Islands because I know them from work I've done in the past. And so they see Canada and party and we still have a norm, we still have the conversation we normally would. But when I've, I've spoken to a number of African delegates, had lunch with a bunch of them, the, the, the two days that I actually ate lunch, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like Gideon was saying. Um, and first thing is like, they just, uh, immediately start telling me what they think the government's doing wrong, uh, which is fantastic. I mean, it, it's good to good to hear it. Uh, um, so it, it definitely, you know, it's a good reminder that we're not, Canada's not the good guys here, right? Um, is one thing. On the liability, the one thing I will say about that quote is that I think that's from the, the environment minister from Stephen Gilbo. Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, in Chris Brown's piece. Um, but it can't be yeah, about liability. Is that a yeah, the only thing I'll say about it is that uh, I don't know the context in which he said it, but the concept that loss and damages shouldn't be about liability, but should be about solidarity. It's not just something, I mean, that is something that like the US has been using, saying we don't want liability. They've been saying that for years. And uh, uh, there's, uh, it's like, you know, like a quarter honest. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But the argument that it shouldn't be about li like compensation and liability, it should be about solidarity actually does not come necessarily just from the Western world. And that there are okay. negotiators across the global South that are making the same argument. So it, they're still saying money, they're saying money should be transferred, but not calling it liability. And so I don't know the context okay. of which environment is saying it. Just, yeah, just, to, and just to be fair well, to him, he may have been saying something bad, but it's hard to know for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying it was bad, uh, but I but yeah. I, I do. The thing that jumped out to me about that quote, and we've seen similar ones from other world leaders about liability, is you know just reading it, you know, scrolling my phone as a human in the audience, I thought, well, if it's not about liability, what is it? But then it sounds like, in, you know, and reading reading more into it, that's quite a legal term, and that could lead down a different path. Is that what you're saying? That if you're getting into liability, it's a different type of compensation so that that is the the argument that the u.s and some other nations have been using okay. for years which is like i said it's maybe like a quarter honest it's mostly dishonest uh the quarter is that actually if you did it as liability you'd have to prove that the event was caused by climate change and figure out how to apportion out the developed world and the math of that is almost impossible so so that's the that's the small little bit of honesty to it but i think it's mostly mostly not uh, I'm just more pointing out that to get around that, there's been this suggestion that money should be offered in solidarity rather than as, as pure legal liability. Yeah. Uh, Has anyone else had any? Oh, go ahead. Would you Has like anyone to else had your any question? reaction to being Canadian? Go ahead, Gideon. Uh, and I'm, I guess to end being Canadian, I personally have not experienced that. Um, I. Um, I want to chime in because I actually disagree with the whole it should be about it shouldn't be about liability. Now, the, the definition of loss and damage to my understanding is it does not include liability. So it's not just the US and not just Canada saying this, but it is like it is what the global north as a general wants it to be about or like it not to be about rather. And considering how Canada has been profiting from oil and gas and fossil fuels in general um, and how much money we receive from it. I think in at least in that sense, not not just be in the sense that um, the, our our exploitation of fossil fuels has caused the climate crisis, but the fact that we have profited from it so much is at least some sense that we should be paying more for loss and damages. For the actual number, I believe um, I heard in passing that we're 
upping our loss and damages from what it was 2.6 billion to 5.3 billion, which I think just from like, I haven't looked too further into it, but it just doesn't seem um, sufficient considering how prominent Canada is in fossil fuel production. And yeah, I'm kind of disappointed in both those statements made by the uh, environmental minister. So I'll just say that. I would just say to compliment that it's uh, in, in indigenous circles and the indigenous pavilion, this has been talked about as a deflection of three things, attributability, answerability, and responsibility. So talking about solidarity, it becomes a humanitarian choice to do or not do. Whereas if you're going into the more, into the attributability, you have to recognize that you're culpable for the creation of the problem, answerability, you need to recognize that something needs to be done about it and it has to do with you. And then responsibility is doing what's right for the other people. But I, I think this, this conversation also happened at, in, the, in, the, um, in the context of who is gonna fund the transition, the energy transition to and at whose expense. So there's a lot of conversation happening about the minerals, the, the essential minerals that are going to be necessary for the energy transition and this, the mining that will happen in indigenous communities without free prior and informed consent that we already know that is already happening and that will just be expanded as um, the business as usual model is, is also expanded. And that then links to the connection, to the, to the discussion on uh, the climate finance. And again, interesting distinction here would be between funding and finance. So if we're talking about funding uh, for reparations, uh, it, it's one thing. And then we talk about loss and damage and then you hear climate finance, which is uh, something completely different. And it's again about the financialization of the disaster. Uh, we, we are in very different, we have very different um, results or outcomes. If you, if just by a change of word, in this, just like the solidarity versus liability. So it's very important that people get educated on the different layers, moving layers of complexity of this debate. There's not just one single layer. There are no quick fixes for this. It's, it's something that it's like moving sands and it's very complex. So educationally, as I'm coming from education, uh, there is a necessity for us to expand our collective capacity to hold space for these multiple layers of complexity for difficult and painful things without feeling overwhelmed, demobilized, or wanting quick fixes or to be rescued from the discomfort. And that's something that education actually doesn't do. We, we, are, uh, we, we try to make it fun, simple, hopeful, and this is actually not happening. I'm not, ha I'm not, help I'm not, not helping because if we, build uh, students' um, understandings on the ground of this hopefulness. The moment that they realize how complex it is, they go back to being disillusioned and disappointed, and then you have uh, the alienation and nihilism that you were trying to avoid by putting the hopefulness there in the first place. So I've been thinking a lot <laughs> about this uh, in the COP as well, in terms of how I deal with my own layers of complexity internally of the emotions that I have to hold of the complexities in the cacophony uh, that you see around us um, in the different even within amongst indigenous people there's no uh, single perspective there are many different perspectives and there are disagreements especially around carbon trading because the allure of money and the financialization and monetization of nature is very high and this is dividing communities and this is being presented as actually one of the impacts of the climate crisis. I've heard communities saying it's easier to fight corporations than to fight the fracture that this is creating in our communities, right? So you have the mining, you have the fractures, you have all these things happening at the same time, but we don't, we have a modern education system that doesn't give us the capacity, that leaves us unequipped to deal with the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of our times. And that's something that UBC could do something about and introduce uh, this, an approach based on complexity to the climate crisis. So sorry, I, I deviated from the Canadian thing because I, I, you actually don't okay. hear much about this. <laughs> the, the, this uh, nationalism is not something that is very high. It's, it's interesting actually, and even amongst young people, 
I've been following more the youth, uh, the indigenous youth, because I have to translate for the young people at the Funikui uh, community participating in the UN forums. But it, it's in, in, the, the, in, in relation to indigenous nations, you're, you're then associated with your nation. You're not perceived as Canadian or US. You're perceived as your nation. So I'm not sure if in other forums, um, being Canadian is, is a big thing. So I don't know. Fair enough. I do want to pick up on, um, on, on that hard piece that you're talking about, Vanessa, of hope. And this was a question from the audience a little bit earlier and kind of the place you know every conversation about climate action is going to go at one point. And I want everyone to take a turn at answering this um, in terms of something coming out of, from COP that either gives you hope or if that feels too saccharine or cliche for you, then something that, that keeps you going on trying to do something about uh, climate change and the role of people in it. Um, and I feel like we haven't heard from Rodri in a little bit. So I'm going to put you on the spot to go first. Thanks for that question, Lisa. Uh, I think definitely throughout the conference, there were a lot of events that did give me hope. I think on the last day of the first week, there was a huge protest in the blue zone. It was an authorized protest um, for, demanding loss and damage for phasing out fossil fuels and just seeing, and that I should say majority of the participants, there were youth participants from all over the world. And that was extremely inspiring and powerful. I think I had goosebumps the entire time um, to see just the amount of pressure and how passionate people are in, and it takes courage to protest in, that kind of in, in Egypt in during COP. Um, I think another thing that gave me hope was more so in the side events, in the pavilion events. I attended a lot of events in um, African nation pavilions as well as uh, small island nation pavilions and where they were talking more about the actual work that was going on, the, on in the ground and sort of more implementation focused work. And I think that was, very inspiring to know because a lot of the other events were very general. So they talked about energy transitions, but did not go into what that actually looks like on the ground. But a lot of the events from the Global South really talked about what they want, how they plan to do to deliver that. And so I think more of the bottom up approach of what grassroots actions are happening is what gave me more hope. Um, Basher, how about you next? Uh, I, I think that's that's a very beautiful question. Um, I was uh, like, pro when we uh, were training for how to deal or how to navigate COP, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I remember one thing that Professor Catherine mentioned in our session that you need to have, you know, a support system because sometimes it might get overwhelming. So throughout the week, I was speaking with my dad about how I feel and doing pulse checks every now and then. And at some point I was saying that, saying to him that unless I go to outer space, I wouldn't feel like, you know, this is the pinnacle of how I feel, how, how much power I have in terms of making a change in this world, because I was bumping into member of parliaments every now and then um, I attended and had conversations with different CXOs who have so much power in dictating and deciding how the world will function. And being an observer there, I recognized the, respons <clears throat> the responsibility and power I have and other students who are similar to me have in deciding how uh, like the next steps are gonna be for this planet. And COP is only for two weeks, but the fight against climate change and the fight that we all are trying to win in terms of making sure that this planet exists is, is, is year long, right? So we have to, uh, I think COP was very energizing for me in terms of um, understanding how my role or my interests and experiences will uh, help me navigate the things that I want to work on. So it was a remarkable experience for me. And I, I'm just hoping and waiting to get back to Vancouver and, 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 and like drawing out the plan that I have for like the coming years on how I want to use my uh, positions in different fields that I'm part of uh, in making a change. Shannon, what about you? What what uh, keep have you seen anything that either gives you hope 
or keeps you going in this fight? Sure. Um, so I would say, I think I pull on really my experiences mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually um, within this context. So um, there are times when I feel mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted, but there's also been times when I've, um, you know, had some spiritual connection and feel strength and rejuvenation from that. So I think, yeah, a lot about COP is like really overwhelming, but then there's certain times, particularly like hearing other Indigenous peoples from, you know, places that I've never been to or people I've never met, and we're talking about the same things. And there's this, you know, spiritual connection that suddenly just makes me feel a surge of energy that I didn't have, you know, a moment before. And like in looking at this as a relational issue rather than a technical issue, I think about, um, you know, the, the field that I've been drawn to medicine and ultimately about healing. And um, like some, like what's going to happen with our planet, with mother earth, like we don't know, like we can't be arrogant enough to know like what's gonna happen. It's, it's, a, it's a sacred mystery, but still within that mystery, I think of when I've, you know, been working with individuals or um, patients who are like palliative, who are dying you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but there's always the opportunity to heal. And so I think, you know, that's what gives me hope within this all is that there's still, you know, there's small portions of, there's a lot of pain within, you know, coming to something like COP and, and the situation we're in day to day in, you know, our lives right now, but there's also these opportunities to heal. And I do have faith that, you know, there is, there is, you know, spiritual connection and healing that can come out of this. And that's where I really talk about like the relational aspect as opposed to the technical in that if we look at it in this different way, like it's, you know, we, we can still hold that hope that um, there's always time to heal. Thank you. Gideon, and if you can keep your thoughts tight as we're going right into the last few minutes that we get together. Sure. Um, first, I'd like to say that hope is almost sometimes a dangerous concept. Uh, one thought that comes to mind is something that Greta Thunberg says is, I don't want your hope in speaking to uh, adults and people in power. I want you to panic so you actually go into action. I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. Um, and yeah. I kind of just want to reiterate what Basher said in terms of you need community in this battle because um, if you go out this alone, you're going to bring yourself out and that's a real struggle. And you really need to lean on those people around you because this is not just about the two weeks. This is about an ongoing fight, about pushing for what we need on for a continuous effort. And that's what all movements are about. And that's what the climate action should be about. Thank you. Simon. Uh, echoing a little bit, I think, of what Gideon was saying, I, I've never really felt that this was about hope or about optimism or about pessimism. It's just about courage and guts. We have to do hard things. This is a huge system that we have to change. And uh, uh, so what makes me feel positive walking around the meeting is that I just see a lot of different types of courage from people around the world. I think I talked to people probably from about 30 different countries in the past few days and all being courageous in different ways doesn't mean we're going to be able to implement the, the scale of change and solutions that are necessary, but it just feels like there's a lot of things being pointed in the right direction, and that's good. And Vanessa, last word to you from the panelists, what gives you courage or hope or whatever? I know I know, hope is hope can be messy, but what, what keeps you going on this? I think the first point is that the future is less dependent on an image we have and invest hope in in the future than on our capacity to repair and rebuild relations and build relationships differently in the present. Uh, and this I'm talking about trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability. And that's the work of, of Kyle White. And I also say that, that it also depends on our capacity to compost our shit. <laughs> and there's a lot of metaphorical and literal shit that needs to be composted. And if we don't have the stomach to do that, the courage, the guts, as, as Simon says, um, it, then, then we run away from it and into quick fixes and easy solutions and paternalistic forms of engagement and ethnocentric ideals of what the future should be. 
So when I, when I see the Hunikui people from the Amazon going around and trying their best and not being heard and knowing that the message doesn't land in a space like this, and still, right, with joy and um, with stamina and with resilience, putting their lives on the line to protect a forest for everybody. That's, I think, what makes, in, in being in serv makes me want to be in service of that. So that's why I'm here <laughs> and I'm working 12 hours a day and translating sometimes eight hours in, in one go. And I would do more of that and I would do overnight so that they can try and try again and try again and, and learn from the mistakes and failures. So I think that's one of the things we can learn from indigenous people or can be taught uh, by indigenous people that we have forgotten how to do. Thank you so much, all of the panelists. I feel very lucky to have been able to learn from you today, and I'm sure our audience feels the same way. I'm going to turn it back over to the UBC folks now. I also feel very lucky. Thank you so much to our delegates and to Lisa for